over to um, nursing and some of the potentials. Um, I'm going to do this as a sort of double act, um, and uh, then Billy's going, uh, Billy Lord is going to step in and um, um, act as discussant both for um, uh, the first presentation we heard and then for this uh, presentation as well. So I'll hand over to, uh, to Richard. Thank you very much, Ian. I don't understand why anyone in their right mind would want to do nursing nowadays. That's what a, sa a staff nurse said to one of our students at the start of a recent placement. And then she continued, all the paperwork, chronic understaffing, and poor pay. To this litany of negativity, we could add a near constant media onslaught and associated low staff morale as evidenced in the RCN reports. Yet despite this negativity, Later this year, over 20,000 people will start pre-registration nursing programmes across the UK. It turns out plenty of people want to do nursing nowadays. But we contend that nurse education can do more and better to prepare those signing up to study the profession they clearly care so passionately about. At its heart, then, this paper is about revitalising nurse education, reinvigorating our students, realising nursing's academic potential, and recapturing nursing's professional identity. It is about finding ways to imaginatively overcome the challenges nursing currently faces as a profession, because nursing is vital. It is about ensuring that nurse education emerges fully fledged from its vocational past to become a truly academic discipline and find a home in the university, because it should be one and it should be there. It is about encouraging educational innovation to equip students to be positive beacons of change because they will shape the future of the profession and the education of its members. It is about enabling student nurses to be confident in their unique knowledge and skills because without, our, uh, without nurses, our NHS just would not work. It is about raising our game and realising our potential and inspiring our students to do exactly the same. It's about pe putting people and their lives and the places where those lives are lived at the heart of our nursing and the way that we think and act as educators, as students and as nurses. Our central idea is that by placing the concept of biogeography centre stage within nurse education, this can revitalise nurse education, reinvigorate our students, realise nursing's academic potential and recapture nursing's professional identity. This paper is designed to stimulate conversations and as such in places we are purposefully provocative. Our paper begins by setting out some background and specifically outlining two dimensions of the contemporary angst that we think currently impedes nursing, triggered respectively by the scandal of Mid-Staffordshire and associated tensions over nursing's transition into the academy, the crises of professional and academic identity. Both issues evidently predate Mid-Staffordshire, but are writ large in the post-Francis debate, and must, we think, be thoughtfully and carefully considered. We then move to outline our own thinking, and specifically this concept of biogeography, which has been born of more coffee-fueled conversations between either of us than we can uh, remember or quite, quite possibly count over the course of the past two years, which, as Ian mentioned, was also the conversations that gave birth to this seminar series. Following this formulation of the theoretical rationale for the use of the concept of biogeography in nurse education, we move very swiftly to its practical application by setting out three spirits of nursing to which we think it can contribute. Spirits of inquiry, empathy, and engagement. Then it will be over to you. But first, let us begin with a deceptively simple question. What is nursing? Thanks, Richard. Okay, so although a predictable starting point, understanding what nursing is and is not, is, a fun is fundamental to our argument, um, so let's begin with a well-rehearsed um, definition, uh, that one put by, forward by uh, Virginia Henderson. Virginia Henderson uh, famously stated, and I quote here, the unique function of the nurse is to assist the individual sick or well in the performance of those activities contributing to health of its recovery or to a peaceful death that he or she would perform unaided if he, again, or she had the necessary strength, will, or knowledge 
and to do this in such a way as to help him or her gain independence as rapidly as possible. The Royal College of Nursing similarly acknowledges that nursing is concerned with health in its widest possible sense, the wholeness of life itself, physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally. Nurses, through their actions, facilitate this fullness by providing care or enabling self-care, often in small, some might say ordinary ways, which are nonetheless hugely significant. Remove any other member of the multidisciplinary team and care could continue, albeit um, with poorer outcomes. Take the nurse out of the team and the care experience diminishes markedly. The casual conversation at the bedside, a meal left untouched, a glass of water that is moved within reach. It is for this reason that when nursing fails, the NHS fails in the eyes of patients, politicians, the public, the press, so on and so forth. And witness the tragic events at Mid Staffordshire NHS Foundation Trust and through other scandals that periodically or too frequently have been recently painfully hitting the headlines. Observation of high patient mortality rates at Stafford Hospital in 2007 precipitated an investigation by the then Healthcare Commission and two full public inquiries initiated by the UK government and chaired, as I mentioned a little earlier, by Robert Francis QC. Each of the, these reports are more critical of standards of care across the Trust. In the first inquiry, Robert Francis stated, and again I quote here, it was striking how many accounts related to basic nursing care, I really emphasize that, to basic nursing care, as opposed to clinical errors leading to injury or death. In other words, care failings were mainly not related to complex interventions going wrong. Rather, it was the so-called basic nursing care that was found wanting. Of course, there is nothing basic about nursing care, and hence, from this point onwards, we're just going to simply refer to it as nursing. It's a highly skilled activity in its own right. In his controversial paper on caring, John Paley, academic, fortunately recently retired from the University of Stirling, contended that there are areas of knowledge and practice to which the nursing profession should and um, could lay claim. Specifically, he argued that nursing should not be enslaved to the biomedical, but rather as the core fields such as palliative care, rehabilitation, and the management of chronic disease. Three, arguably, of the most important areas of contemporary health care, given demographic, uh, current demographic trends. These are domains of practice where evidence-based nursing, and again I emphasize the word nursing knowledge and skills, are considerable. Take, for example, the recognition that encouragement of early mobilization is an important determinant of the survival and the quality of life following a stroke. Nursing is at its most effective and distinctive when it's focused on people's everyday lives, when nursing facilities, those activities of living, to use the well-known Roper, Logan, and Tierney um, ideas around the activities of living, core part of um, nursing care. Now, another important component of care failings at Mid Staffordshire was a lack of compassion. And recently, John Paley, um, in a further paper, has quoted similar con uh, con uh, controversy in his analysis of these events drawing on social psychology, a debate to which we will return later. No one would disagree that it is a desire to care that attracts over 20,000 people into nurse education in the UK each year. Nor would they challenge that caring is a central component of nursing, as with all healthcare professions, or that critical reflection on what it is to care should be part of pre-registration nursing programmes. But nursing need not be defined by care. Returning to John Paley's earlier paper and in considering nursing's core, it does not have an exclusive claim to care. There is no harm, John Paley writes, in nurses being caring, provided no attempt is made to identify 
nursing with caring. However, we should not lose sight of the fact that, if we are to learn anything from Mid Staffordshire, to care is to perform and embody the essential skills and knowledge to contribute to some of the most challenging areas of contemporary health care. Specifically, it is to meet the day-to-day, -day, sometimes mundane, mundane, but always essential, very often dirty work that supports people's ex uh, people experiencing illness or injury to live or die well. This is nursing, and it needs no qualification. Except it does, a degree. In the UK, this has not always been the case, and nursing's transition into the university has been controversial, to say the least. Especially as attaining its status as an all-graduate entry profession coincided with publication of the all-encompassing second report into the scandal of Mid Staffordshire that exposed a litany of care failures by nurses <coughs> in testimony after testimony. Concern largely revolves around the perception that in its apparent move from vocational apprenticeship into the academy, nursing has somehow lost <coughs> part of its identity, or worse, nurse education is simply unable to instill in its future registrants the core skills and values such as care and compassion that were previously developed and could only be developed on the ward. Put simply, time in the ivory towers does not a nurse make. This is not a new debate, nor are its frequently rehearsed terms of reference particularly accurate. Nurses have obtained degrees for decades. At the time of the change, over a quarter of nurses had already held degrees, and among them, individuals who now hold very prominent positions in the profession. Moreover, in accordance with the European Union agreement, the UK's Nursing Midwifery Council, the profession's regulatory body, stipulates in its standards of proficiency for pre-registration education that programmes must be no less than 4,600 hours in duration and constitute 50% theory and 50% practice. Students, student nurses must therefore spend at least 2,300 hours in practice working alongside a clinical mentor and other colleagues before qualifying, equivalent to 192 12-hour shifts or 64 36-hour weeks. Further, a recent report, which Ian mentioned previously, published in The Lancet, reported the association between mortality and nurse education across nine European countries found that an increased number of graduates decreased patient mortality. The Willis Commission on Nurse Education dismissed the notion that a more academic profession was associated with a decline in caring. Nursing's place in the academy appears secure, but in our view, it is far from established. And we're not alone. Thompson and Derbyshire recently have chided the profession's killer elite for sabotaging its development as an academic discipline. In their opening salvo to that editorial, they write, the growth and development of academic nursing is being hampered, if not sabotaged, by our very own mandarins of mediocrity. These are the academic leaders whose own slender scholarship and contribution to nursing is out of all proportion to the stifling and inhibiting influence that they wield. And responses to their paper suggest that many others within the profession agree with this cutting analysis. Nursing as an academic discipline faces a challenging future. The move into the university has arguably forced us to raise our game, and rightly so. We are committed to establishing nursing's place as an academic discipline, but to do so requires scholarship to become more prominent. Here we suggest that nursing can do so by learning from disciplines that have occupied and actually frequently wrestled with their place in the academy for decades, the social sciences. Far from diminishing nursing's core, this enhances the nursing skills and knowledge we described earlier. And here we are in good company. We are certainly not the first to suggest, as I mentioned earlier, the need to encourage scholarship or to elevate the role of the social sciences in nurse education. Gary Rolfe argued that uh, sociological imagination provides a platform for a more critically engaged discipline and hinted at the potential contribution that it might make to teaching care and compassion. Benny Goodman, um, who will be speaking this afternoon, further developed uh, the idea as a tool to enable engagement in critical thinking for nursing students to encourage them to reflect on the socially embedded lives of their patients. And both would likely agree with Neil McPherson's assertion that, to 
term sociology should form a central pillar of pre-registration nurse education. Neither is the idea of integrating geography in nursing education new. Gavin Andrews, as he pointed out in his presentation, and as he also um, made the case for in a paper in 2006, has made a compelling case for the use of geographical insights to encourage students to engage with the spatial aspects of health and healthcare delivery. Teaching informed by the social sciences, such as sociology, geography, and anthropology, has been a feature of undergraduate nursing programs, although, as it has been noted, uh, their inclusion has been far from consistent. Again, um, a point made in Neil McPherson's 2008 paper. And it also lacks a theoretical rationale, a point that's been made by a number of people, including Stephen Timmons, um, again, one of the uh, team um, here today. Here we present this clear theoretical rationale by proposing a concept of biogeography as a pedagogical approach and moreover provide routes to its practical application in our pre-registration nursing programs. In doing so, we seize the opportunity to make a much more confident claim that the social sciences, and in this case specifically human geography, should be central to nurse education. Although treading new ground, our uh, uh, aim is to draw together fragmented scholarship which has hitherto hovered expectant and filled with latent potential on the edges of nurse education and realise its potential to address the angst that hinders nursing's emergence as a truly academic discipline. For those of us who studied geography at school, the word biogeography probably stirs up distant memories of standing in a field in some less than exotic location, almost certainly shivering, repeatedly tossing a quadrat around the ground to try and calculate the percentage of different types of vegetation that are found underfoot. Biogeography, by this textbook definition, is a branch of geography concerned with the spatial distribution of plant and animal life and the interaction of this flora and fauna with this wider environment. Put boldly, biogeography is concerned with life in place. But in the time since all of us here left school, biogeography has evolved. In an important 2001 editorial, Tom Spencer and Sarah Watmore called for a different biogeography that invests attention in rather different assemblages of phenomena and modes of inquiry than those of the plant and animal, animal geographies associated with the Hartzorian project of mapping patterns of spatial distribution and aerial differentiation. Part of this project of putting life back into the discipline was a recalibration of the relationship between human society and the natural world. Later in our seminal paper held in More Than Human Approaches to Understanding the World, which we've already heard about this morning, one more re remark that the vital connection between geo, the earth, and bio, life, is amongst the most enduring of geographical concerns. She continued, the durability of these concerns bears the hallmark of geography's history, which like anthropology and archaeology, took shape before the division of academic labours into social and natural sciences became entrenched. It is a division with which these disciplines have never been entirely comfortable, and with which they continue to wrestle more self-consciously and sometimes productively than others. Nursing too wrestles with this division. Even a quick sprint through its disciplinary history reveals that nursing has variously and sometimes simultaneously been positioned as a natural biomedical science, found a home in the humanities or considered a social science. We contend that our concept of biogeography provides a path, theoretically, and perhaps more importantly, pedagogically, across an impasse that we suggest has hampered nursing's emergence as a true academic discipline. So taking our cue from Watmore and drawing on Patchett and Lorimer's kind of more malleable use of the term, we propose that the two constituent parts of biogeography, biography and geography, are both vitally connected and combined bring renewed vitality to nurse education. Biography is inherent to nursing practice. Daily nurses take patients' histories, listening attentively, probing appropriately, jotting down significant events and circumstances in order to accurately retell the story of an individual's illness or injury 
to colleagues, relatives, or indeed patients themselves. Nurses are already biographers, authors of accounts of individuals' lives. However, rarely are they biogeographers, chronicles of individuals' lives in place. To be sure, the concept of lived experience looms large over nurse practice, research, and education. Students are encouraged to attune themselves to others as part of a process of attaining an empathetic understanding by exploring lived experience through their conversations, engagement with qualities of research, or indeed autobiographical accounts of living with illness. However, so often this exploration is aspatial. Students sojourned into experience occur on a sanitised, tidy, almost abstracted plane of reflection rather than taking place at the nexus of the bio and the geo in what Watmore calls the livingness of the world. <clears throat> Recognition of the inseparable link between biography and geography, for example, brings scandals such as the lottery of life expectancy at various geographical scales sharply into view. That a child born in 2012 in the UK will have a life expectancy of 80 and a child born in Sierra Leone will, live, will likely live to just 45. That for every two stops travelled east on London's Jubilee Underground Line from Westminster to Canning Town, over one year of male life expectancy is lost. That a man living in Merkinch, just four miles west of where this seminar is taking place today, will live 14 years less than a man living four miles south in Locarno. To be sure, these are well-known and easily grasped observations, but nevertheless, they highlight the inextricable interplay between people and place. But it's only by extending the concept of biogeography incrementally beyond this kind of textbook understanding of spatial patterning of individuals' lives and deaths to fully embrace the livingness of the world that nurse education will be emancipated. Certainly, as Andrews also acknowledges, increasing awareness of aerial differentiation uh, in health outcomes such as life expectancy is a helpful pedagogical entry point. But it is, we suggest, only by putting the concept of biogeography centre stage in nurse education that student nurses will gain an appreciation of the crucial and complex ways through which places shape individuals' health experiences, <coughs> behaviours and opportunities. In so doing, biogeography as a critical pedagogy, following after Paul Freire's work, attunes students to others' lives and similar sharpens a critical and indeed radical edge to their nursing praxis. At the same time, as we go on to argue, through this educational intervention, patient-nurse dualisms are shattered, theory practice gap is closed, and the discipline of nursing fully and finally emerges to occupy its place in the academy and embrace its status as an academic discipline. Now, Andrews has previously suggested and stressed the vital importance of nurse education to nursing's disciplinary development. Arguably, as the starting point of all nursing, nursing education is a particularly important field that demands more sustained attention. Indeed, any emerging disciplinary field, social scientific or otherwise, has to be anchored in and articulated at the education level so that generations of new practitioners and scholars will be familiar with it and some able to apply it. We suggest that biogeography has potential to revitalize nurse education and invigorate student nurses. So let us now take just one example of how this critical pedagogy can be realized in the classroom by engaging with a live debate in what appears at first the tangential field of urban studies, neighborhood effects research. The central premise of neighborhood effects, as critical urban geographer Tom Slater notes, stems from an understanding of society that adheres to one overarching assumption that where you live affects your life chances. However, the problem, as Slater continues, is that this idea is seductively simple and on the surface very convincing. Somebody growing up in, say, a seven-bedroom mansion in a leafy residential suburb surrounded by golf courses in the stockbroker belt of Surrey, England, will have far more chances in life than somebody growing up in a stigmatised social housing estate less than 30 miles away in the London borough of Tower Hamlets, for decades one of the most multiply deprived parts of England, with high levels of unemployment, poor health outcomes and little green space. As Slater writes, who could argue with that? But Slater does. He proposes an alternative take on, his thesis, on the thesis that is pertinent to our unfolding argument. 
Slater proposes, and I quote, an absolutely fundamental structural question that is rarely, if ever, tabled at virtual or actual gatherings of those concerned with neighbourhood effects. That question is, why do people live where they do in cities? If where any given individual lives affects their life chances as deeply as neighbourhood effects proponents believe, it seems crucial to understand why that individual is living there in the first place. If we invert the neighbourhood effects thesis, he says, to your life chances affect where you live, then the problem becomes one of understanding life chances via a theory of capital accumulation and class struggle in cities. For our purposes here, we need not move Slater's arguments to its final analysis informed by Marx's thought, although we acknowledge that there's clearly much more room for Marx in nurse uh, education and practice. What it reveals for us is the vital importance and potential of biogeography as a lens through which to address the key challenges to nurse education outlined earlier. Slater's inversion of the neighbourhood effects thesis reveals the proposition that lies at the heart of our concept of biogeography, insofar as it invests agency in each of its constituent parts. Biography and geography actively conti and continuously rework each other. Biogeography is not only inseparable, it is co-constituted. Put another way, and let us now explicitly substitute the term life chances for health, and understanding that where you live affects your health only takes us so far. An explicit acknowledgement that your health affects where you live, and that health in this formulation is an absolutely fundamental, structural, as Slater would say, concern, both an asset to use the common public health parlance and constrained by capital. Arriving at this realisation of the wider structural process that constrain people's lives, and more importantly, this, such processes can be challenged, has, we contend, considerable potential for biogeography as a critical pedagogy to inspire what we call spirited student nurses, as we go on to explain. For doing so, however, it should be acknowledged that the call for nurse education and its educators to sharpen a radical edge and connect more explicitly with issues of social justice is not new. Almost 20 years ago, with Project 2000 looming large in nurse education, Jane Harden, drawing on the writing of Habermas and Fier, called for a nurse education to become enlightening, empowering, and emancipatory, and noted it's time to get radical. And that was in 1996. Two decades later, we struggled to find evidence of this radical movement in nurse education. But we believe that this remains a noble aim. And as we will see, our students feel the same. The reason such ideas, just as those of the social sciences more generally, have intervention after intervention, editorial after editorial, failed to take root, is because they are arguably rather abstract. We get as far as why without full ex examination of how. Biogeography provides what we suggest as an answer to both questions by providing a practical approach to push as far as hard and hoped, if students so wish, while well, moving through and instilling, or even perhaps distilling, equally vital and vitalizing qualities of a nurse en route. So let's move on now to think about those um, three spirits that we mentioned in the introduction. We now uh, move on to describe what we call these three spirits, uh, but we believe pedag uh, uh, pedagogy built around the concept of biogeography can inspire in our student nurses spirit of, uh, of inquiry, spirit of empathy, and a spirit of engagement. Our use of the term spirit here is not meant in the ethereal, otherworldly sense, but rather to trace the etymology of the term to its Latin uh, root breath, that which animates and is vital to life. Hence we suggest that combined, these inspire spirited nursing among our students, which ultimately reinvigorates and revitalizes nurse education. So first of all, the spirit of inquiry. To kindle the spirit of inquiry requires that uh, we actively engage our students. Doing so involves ideas being made accessible, such that they can grapple with them, rather than getting lost in the technical detail or bamboozled by beguiling language. The challenge of utilising the social sciences in a way that is meaningful to students is not straightforward. The ideas of the social sciences are difficult to grasp, as any geography, sociology or anthropology undergraduate will willingly attest, and arguably more so for nursing students, for whom the subject will, at best, form only an element of their studies, although 
we argue that this should be a, a, a major core component. One strength of biogeographical approaches is that uh, by being rooted in practice, they are made meaningful to nursing students. Clear links can be drawn between theory and practice. For example, as we hinted earlier, the taking of patient histories becomes a biogeographical exercise. Conversations that develop between student and patients or their relatives enable students to discover how individuals' lives have been shaped and structured by circumstances to genuinely understand their health, health-related behaviours, or their engagement, or lack of, with health services. Take that final point, the lack of engagement with healthcare. The interaction between structure and individual agency becomes utterly meaningful and personally relevant to students. For example, we have in mind here teaching around the inverse care law. This law essentially states that those who most need healthcare are the ones that are least likely to utilise services and, uh, and support. The reasons why those living in marginalised circumstances are less likely to engage with health services are legion. Lower literacy rates, ability to negotiate increasingly bureaucratic systems, high levels of morbidity that place demands on finite appointment times, and so forth. The central point here is that individual nurses may unwittingly contribute to this wider structural malignancy. Biogeographical approaches potentially reveal to students that their role uh, that they may have may be far from benign. Reflecting on implications of a nursing practice encourages students to connect the day-to-day -day reality of their nursing practice to theory. Take another example, the tumultuous response to uh, John Paley's um, controversial editorial here he proposed an alternative take on the tragedy of care failings at Mid Staffordshire NHS Trust, informed by social psychology. Quite aside from the light this sheds on the reception of ideas from outward nursing within its disciplinary walls, the outworking of the structure agency debate through the pages of Nurse Education Today can also be made transparent through the biogeographical approaches. By reformulating this debate as the interplay between people, nurses, and place, hospital, rather than providing resolution to such debates, biogeographical approaches may affect their escape from nursing, uh, from nursing journals and their entry into pre-registration programmes. They do so by inspiring students to wrestle with ideas and recognise the need to hold them in tension, to revisit them and reappraise them over time. Releasing the spirit of inquiry excites our students in such a way that they want to grapple with those wicked issues within current nursing, those issues for which there is no straightforward resolution. Let me move on now to the second of these spirits, the spirit of empathy. The spirit of empathy is stirred by seeing ourselves in others and recognising the way our lives uh, have been and are constrained and enabled by wider social circumstances, um, troubles the simplistic no uh, notion of them and us. Students can very easily reflect in class how their own lives have been influenced by where they have lived, the geo, and opportunities through their life course, the bio. In so doing, bio, biogeographical pedagogy breaks down the patient-nurse dualism, holding the potential to facilitate empathy. Recently, Gary Rolfe perceptively observed that it is much less likely a nurse will leave a patient in need at the end of his or her shift if there is insight into their experience. And I quote from Gary Rolfe, he said, I care about my children because I love them and they are my children, which motivates me to care for them. I care about strangers whom I encounter in hospital because I am able to imagine myself or my children in their situation. Without this em uh, empathetic imagination, we have only our training and our duty to fall back on. And I end the quote there. 
challenging students to consider their own lives and specifically how their own biogeography has shaped their lives, their experiences and attitudes, even their prejudices, can actively challenge those preconceptions, however subconsciously held, through recognition that the similar influences may have shaped their patients' attitudes and experiences and affect a shift away from individual blame, as is arguably fostered by a biomedical approach that still permeates the nursing profession. So let me now finally move on to the third spirit, the spirit of engagement. The explicit focus for the structural constraints on individuals' health that comes sharply into view through a biogeographical approach might also be a uh, release, a spirit of engagement. By this we mean a desire to not only understand, but to change the, uh, the world, and specifically the nursing world, and the lives uh, for whom nurses care so deeply for and about, again to use Gary Rolf's uh, terms. Nurses are already advocates. They are already encouraged through the six C's to be courageous on behalf of their patients and profession. But recognition of the structuring circumstances and that these structures might be changed might encourage a spirit of engagement born of a keen sense of social justice sparking activism. This is best expressed by one of our students. In response to a disheartening placement experience that uh, started with a staff nurse's lament with which we opened, uh, which stated, uh, with a staff nurse stated, I don't understand why anyone in their right mind would want to do nursing nowadays, or the paperwork, chronic understaffing, and poor uh, pay. James uh, Shewan uh, wrote uh, in a From the Hearts column in the RCN Bulletin, and I quote from it, as nursing students, we can play a unique role in bringing positivity, freshness, and enthusiasm into placements. By embracing this, expressing ourselves, and speaking up, we may just empower others to be the change they want to see. For place, placements with campuses, and a job as nursing educators is exactly the same. It is to inspire spirited students who enter a battered and bruised nursing profession, bold and brave. Thank you.